I am Brad Keeler. They are Murray and Del Fredland. Find out on Director's Cut next what they think about the future of civil and geotechnical engineering. Institute. That is why we call this show Director's Cut. This week, we have a very special opportunity to interview two family members. Both have spent their lives devoted to civil engineering, geotechnical engineering, and even more specifically within that, a field that we will find out a little bit more about throughout the interview. Every week, I sit down with a different GI member. We find out things about their personal life, about their professional life. We make sure everything is fun. So I'm very happy to be joined by Geo Legend, 2005 Terzaghi lecturer Del Fredland, and his son, founder of Soil Vision, now with Bentley, Murray Fredland. Del Murray, thanks for joining me today. Glad to be here, Brad. And I yes, think Brad. we're... I think we're going to have a good time. We will begin the same way we begin with every guest. And you guys will have to figure out the pecking order here. Describe your jobs in 45 seconds. I well, I, I will start. Um, you, because you said jobs, I assume it's plural, not what I'm doing now, but what I have done over the past uh, 57 years. Up to you. And, and I have 45 seconds to do 57 years. Well, let me say, first of all, I spent 34 years at the University of Saskatchewan teaching and doing research, mainly in unsaturated soil mechanics. I, I took early retirement in the year 2000 because I had many, a number of invitations to come to countries in Southeast Asia and mentor their graduate students. So I spent a year at NTU in Singapore, another three winters in Hong Kong, uh, a year in Japan, uh, and uh, China, three years, and Vietnam many, many times. And so that's what I did after my so-called retirement 21 years ago. And then I, um, I was approached by a company called Golder Associates, and they said, you know, you wouldn't have to fill out all those forms to get acts go into all these different countries if you just came and worked for us. So I thought that would be a rather unique neat experience to see whether or not all the theory I had talked about and tried to produce over the years, whether you could put it into practice and make money. So that was my goal with Golder was try to make money on what I had researched. And that has led me to today I'm uh, I'm in retirement. I thought it would be all rest and travel, no travel. <laughs> And no rest. I'm still <laughs> turning out research papers. <laughs> Murray, over to you. Sure. Yeah. Well, my uh, my story is a little shorter here, but uh, I started uh, I started Soil Vision in 1997 as a hobby and as a way to avoid starvation going through grad school, and just kept it going in the background. And when I got done, I realized I had an interest in that, so I did that full time and. Um, it took it 23 years and the development of eight different software packages, which I enjoyed immensely and uh, quite a, a life, a career building uh, opportunity. I, I'd learned a lot about geotech in school, but then had to learn the, all the business side of things through starting the company. And I uh, greatly enjoyed that, I must say, and built a great team up under, under that. But I uh, got to a place where uh, within uh, we were approached and eventually sold to Bentley, and uh, now I'm a strategic, uh, senior strategic advisor, geotechnical in Bentley. I spend most of my time working on the strategic direction, looking to, into the future for geotech. I was fortunate to be a part of a team that worked on uh, moving Bentley into mining space, and that resulted in the recent uh, acquisition of, of Sequence, and uh, it's been exciting times been exciting times now. I, I largely spend my time doing training, uh, setting strategic direction and working on the uh, 3D slope stability product and moving that forward. 
That is great. We will get back to some of the details that both of you outlined there later on in the show. First, though, we ask many fun questions on Director's Cut. And so this is the first of those. And it's simple. What is one article of clothing you would never, ever consider wearing? And Murray, we will start with you on this one. <laughs> well, I had a hard, a hard time thinking about this because I thought, what is what a, a article of clothing I wouldn't wear or my wife wouldn't let me wear? And I settled on one that my wife would not let me wear. And that was a favorite high school jean jacket that I just loved. But I'm going to have to see that into retirement here. And uh, as it's just sitting in the closet. And every time I try to put it on, my wife says, you're not wearing that. And uh, <laughs> I'll put it away. <laughs> but it's there for posterity. Dell, what right. about you? <laughs> I don't know if you know that I'm over 80 years of age. And I, uh, that was, this is a hard question for me to answer because I look around and I see what the teenagers are wearing these days. And uh, skinny jeans, skinny jeans I would never wear. And I don't know why they have holes in the knees of their jeans and they pay more money for them. That doesn't make sense to me. Usually here, you know, we live in Canada and we're usually thinking about when I go out the door, do I put on a sweater? Do I put on a pleasant jacket? Do I put on a parka and a toque? So I don't think of down to skinny jeans <laughs> and I would never wear them. Well, you'll be happy. Skinny jeans are, are going. My wife has told me they, they their time has passed and all of the stuff I've held on to from the late 90s is coming back. So I, uh, my big <laughs> jeans are cool again. <laughs> They're just not in very good shape anymore. <laughs> So this next question is is for Dell. Dell, you you are Mr. or Dr. Unsaturated Soils to a lot of people. You are kind of the beacon of that field, I think. Can you remember the moment or the set of moments where you realized that was going to become your specialty? Well, first of all, you're very generous in uh, describing the path I have taken. But I th you know, I look back and I was in third year of engineering undergraduate when I uh, found out that un the soil mechanics was the most interesting class in my civil engineering program. And then between third and fourth year of um, uh, civil engineering, I got a job working for a department of transport in Saskatoon, extending the runways. And I spent a whole summer out in the hot sun, digging little holes in the compacted gravel, filling the hole up with Ottawa sand, and I became excited about this stupid test. And I, it, it interested me. I kept thinking about if I did research, how could we make this more accurate? And then at, at, at the end, so it was really in between third and fourth year that I became interested in soil mechanics. Then when I graduated, I had a couple of job offers. One offered me $450 a month, and the other one offered me 425 I took the one for 425 because it was it was with the National Research Council of Canada, and I was to learn how to do research on houses built on expansive soils. So you have to realize that Saskatchewan is in the middle of a semi-arid region where the soils are dry, and you build a house on it, and moisture accumulates under, and the houses swell and crack. So I spent time with the National Research Council, uh, trying to figure out how we can build houses that don't crack. And uh, that intrigued me. Uh, there was um, the head of the National Research Council was Robert Leggett, and he encouraged me to do research. And uh, so I, that's how I got started. And then I uh, had the good opportunity by the time, uh, both for my master's and PhD to go to the University of Alberta and study in a specific area. My supervisor in Dr. Morgenstern in, uh, for my PhD degree was um, a very encouraging person, but he also taught me how to do research and, and uh, I owe a lot to, to his mentoring. Well, that is a fantastic story. Thank you for that. And I'm, I'm sure the viewers are gonna love that one. This next question was originally directed only at Murray, but Dell, I, I think you might want to weigh in here at the end, but we'll start with Murray on this. You mentioned up at the top of the show that Soil Vision had been acquired by Bentley a few years ago. Um, what was the experience like for you personally when 
maybe when you got that call initially that there was interest there or when you got to the end of the road and it was complete. I, I mean this more in business terms, I guess, than in technical ones. Just what was your experience like through that process? Yeah, it was an interesting experience, I would say. It wasn't, I mean, I was in the mode where you're putting your head down and you're working hard. And uh, I wasn't necessarily thinking about being acquired or anything like that. I mean, we were just focused on growth. We'd had a, a few good years and we're, we're had strong growth. We we're working hard on it. But I noticed some Bentley people showing up to a webinar I was giving one day and thought, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. And then I all of a sudden got a phone call uh, the next day and uh, they started talking to me about, um, you know, maybe we uh, could do some greater things partnered together. And initially I wasn't, I thought, well, I'm a little young. I wasn't planning to sell the company. And, but when I sat down and thought about it, you know, like I, you, you start to realize you're not going to live forever and your, your career has a certain limited lifespan and, um, you know, you don't always get opportunities every day. So, um, you know, when I thought through it, we were trying to grow and I was hitting certain barriers. And I realized that actually going with Bentley alleviates a lot of these barriers of just growing uh, the company through all of these, you know, just having more of a global impact, for example, and uh, obtaining distributors and um, sales in every part of the world in every language. And Bentley's very worldwide. They have offices in 65 countries and they're just very well suited to distribute software around the world and very good at it. So um, it, it really was a process, I would say, on my part, where uh, at first I wasn't um, I wasn't for it. And then all of a sudden I realized, you know what, you've taken the company 23 years. You really need somebody, you need a partner, somebody bigger than you to take it into the next phase. And that's a good thing. And so it's very much an emotional up and down though. I mean, yeah. because you, you're, you're, you're wanting to do this yet you realize that you're, you're going to lose all control of this and you've got to be okay with that. And you really have no certainty. I mean, you try to ask a lot of questions in the process and I'm, I'm sure I, I stretched the patience of a lot of Bentley people and all the questions I answered, but they, they were very gracious and answered my questions. And um, in the end, reassured me and that this was a, a good thing. And uh, it was a good process overall. I mean, it's up and down. We weren't uh, on the back end. We weren't knowing about that they were pursuing multiple companies. And so we heard mid process, oh, they've acquired Plaxis. Too. And so that all of a sudden you, you go from a real high and then, oh, OK, this changes things. And right. uh, but uh, it's a, so there's a lot of up and downs emotionally is what I would say that go through in the background. My, my wife would say that if you were to ask her that. <laughs> and uh, but it's all good in the end. It, it worked well. I enjoy working with a larger team and it's exciting to see where uh, we can go. I think as, as a larger team working with the Plaxis group, I enjoy. It's nice for being part of a bigger team and having uh, excellent people all over the world that you can just team up with rather than having to create that yourself and do it. So overall, it's it's a great thing. I've really enjoyed it. So if you gave if you could give one piece of advice to you know someone with a technical or scientific background who's in the same situation, maybe starting this or going through it right now, what would it be? Oh, that's a great question. You're making me think on the spot here, but um, I oh think yeah, we always have bonus questions. <laughs> there you go. Throw me sideways. I think just you know, be open to possibilities. See the the greater world view. See where you want to to go, and be um, oh, um, don't be afraid of the future and what might come of it. You know, it's it's a stretch. Some of the biggest things that can be good for us require the biggest risk and the biggest uncertainty in our lives. So don't be worried about when you have decisions that have great uncertainty, because maybe this is a good thing for the future and it can move you to a phase that you could have never accomplished on your own. Well, that's great. And originally when I put that question in there, it was just directed at you, Murray, but Dell, I think you've got some insight on this as well in your time with Geoslope. Uh, yeah, my story goes back to 1966 when I was a young professor at came to the University of Saskatchewan to teach. And there was a, an elderly man who, Robert Peterson, who was the designer of the South Saskatchewan River Dam. And he came to me and said, you know, if I was a young man starting my career at, at the university like you are, he said, I would give some serious thought to this thing they call the computer. 
He says, I think it's going to change, <laughs> change the way we do our engineering. And so I took them seriously. I learned basic. I learned Fortran, and I wrote a slope stability program. And then I did a very controversial thing. <laughs> I started a company called GeoSlope, along with my brother, who was trained as a systems analyst. And so we built up GeoSlope, and it grew and became bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, it was time to turn it over to the employees of the company and I sold my shares and got out. So, uh, and then it was within a matter of a short while after that, that my son, unknown to me, started Soil Vision. I say unknown to me because my wife and I were living in Hong Kong and I was teaching at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I arrived back in Canada and Murray greeted me at the airport and say, dad, I started a company. I says, oh no. <laughs> and I think we'll leave it. We'll leave it there. <laughs> that is a great story, though. What for you, Dell? What was the biggest piece of advice you remember giving Murray when he started up Soil Vision? I, I the advice I gave him was you shouldn't do it. It's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> but but he did it anyways, and he was very successful. And I realize now that he was able to do things that I could never do. Uh, I think he's got a sharper mind than I have. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to say that after the interview is over. <laughs> I'll take it though. So no, it was a stretching experience, I would say, starting the company and growing. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, and I, I must say, I enjoyed the what I, bringing the geotech on the one side and the software. I was always interested in programming computers and doing software development, and uh, this was a way to just bring the two together in the perfect job for me. And uh, it was it was a nice adventure. I enjoyed it. That is great. Dell, yeah. you used the word controversial in your answer to the last one. So we're going to start with you this time. For both of you, what is the most controversial decision you've made throughout your career? Well, I, I would say I did something even more controversial than what I told you about. And in 1993, I was on sabbatical at uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And before my year was up, I had this great desire within me to go and visit the country of Vietnam. I didn't know anybody in Vietnam. I, I heard about a, a government official and made contact with him. And I went into Vietnam, which had an embargo imposed, so it was hard to get in. But I got in in 1993 and spent a week there. I lectured at several universities and asked them what they wanted, what they would need to rebuild. And they said, we need books. I came back to Singapore, went back to Canada, and I was invited to do a cross-Canada lecture tour where I would stop in every city and give lectures uh, uh, one day after another. Each place where I lectured, I put up a slide on the screen and I said, um, this is my address and I have a dream. The dream is to build the largest library in a country of 80 million people and I can do it with your books if you send them to me. Now, to my surprise, by the time I arrived back in Saskatoon, the books were arriving by the hundreds and even thousands. And believe it or not, I soon had enough books to fill a 20-foot shipping container for Vietnam. And uh, I um, sent that container, but that's not the only, the books still kept coming. I bought a, a soils lab for $100 and got all their equipment. And I sent a second container. And I'll conclude this part of the story by saying I was very grateful for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who paid for shipping the second 20-foot shipping container to Vietnam. This started a long love relationship with the country of Vietnam. I have probably visited the country three dozen times. I was given by the government of Canada uh, um, the three quarters of a million dollars to have a technology exchange program. And so uh, it was very controversial to go and do this. But uh, it, when I look back now, it's one of the significant things in my life. That is fantastic and ahead of your time, I think, because as you saw much in later years, Vietnam became a much more strategic partner, I think, certainly for both North American countries. And uh, 
that was some real foresight there. That is excellent. Murray, what about you? What controversy have you stirred up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was trying to think about that in, in what uh, angle. And uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. The t- uh, what, I, what I interpreted it as is when I was running Soil Vision, we hit a place where all of a sudden I realized that there was a problem and we had to make some big decisions. And they were going to affect the whole direction of the company. And some people may or may not like them. And uh, it's going to be painful. And uh, so I'll just talk about maybe two of them. The first one was is we, we developed the software first on a, on a software development platform that was quick to get things out. It was quick to market. We could make products rapidly and develop them. And we, we, got, we were successful. We got them out, got them promoted, and got pe- them in people's hands. But it was like a, uh, how do I say it? It was like a burning platform. We realized that we, this platform wasn't extensible around the world as well. It was having all kinds of troubles with installation. And I realized that we were going to have to actually reprogram all the software on a different software platform. And uh, it's, it was just painful. That's all I can describe it as. And then how do you, you know, float the sales and keep the revenue going when you're undergoing a multi-year conversion program? And that was tough. So what we did is it, we estimated it. It's going to take a year and a half. Um, it ended up being a complete reprogram, and it took three years. And software companies do this, but uh, in the long run, that was the best decision that I could have made at that time because then we had extensibility. We had all kinds of freedom in what direction we could, we wanted to go with the software, and it was all good. But um, the second controversial one is we were going to go into – we decided to go into uh, 3D limit equilibrium slope stability. And we weren't, we were in finite element and, and unsaturated soils databases. And we decided we're going to go into 3D slope stability. And um, that was a big project for us at that time. We we tried to get money to, uh, like grants to support the development because we couldn't self-fund. It, it was too big. We applied at one place and the government guy basically says, you're, you're not big enough to handle this project. We won't give you the money. And so uh, I redid the proposal and uh you know worked on it again proposed it to a different agency and we got the funding and uh did the project it took us again about three three to five years to pull it off and uh that's now was our crown jewel in the company the 3d slope stability was uh, our biggest seller and our biggest product and so but it was it came out of a lot of angst and stress and not sure if we could even do this project or pull it off and so I would view that as the most controversial thing because it it had the you know potential to really either hurt the company or to move us to a whole new level. And in the end, it moved us to a whole new level. So it was good. But I think the common thread in those stories to me, Dell and yours and, and Murray and the two of yours is belief, right? You have to believe deep down that you're doing the right thing and the benefits of what you're going to do are going to outweigh any negative feedback you get along the way. And I always think you can tell you can tell how successful something's going to be by the amount of time you spend on it between the hours of like midnight and 5 a.m. And now, uh, Murray, I'm going to guess you had a lot of those with your software. <laughs> yeah, there was moments where we just weren't sure we were going to be able to do it internally. I mean, we had we tried out various programmers. They didn't work. We tried better ones and they worked. And, we, and in the end, we got a great team that could pull it off. But it was a very much a trial and error process. We tried importing uh, immigrating one person from out of country, it didn't work off. It didn't work out after six months. Like there was all kinds of uncertainty and and false starts along the way. But in the end, we pulled it off. So that is great. <laughs> so we ask two questions of everybody who's on the show. The first one was our lead question about your jobs. The second one is how you originally got involved in ASCE and the Geo Institute. We'll we'll start with Murray on this one. Sure. Yeah. Like we, uh, for us, it was the conferences. I think getting involved, we, there was a strong desire in the early days of the, the company to be a part of things that are going on, be a part of great things that are going on, engage with the Geo Institute. And we realized that that's the key organization to engage with in the U.S. and to meet great people that we can collaborate with. And so it started off with us basically having booths at the conference and trying to engage with various people. And Brad, I know like this is later on, we met you later on and 
and have enjoyed working with you and uh, over the years and, and just engaging with a, a larger pe- a larger group of people and the Geo Institute has provided that to us in spades. Great. Dell, what about you? How'd you get your start with ASCE and GI? Well, I really be, uh, got started first with ASCE, even before Geo Institute was developed. Uh, in 1965, I was working for a consulting engineering firm, and they decided to send me to the first expanse of soils conference in College Station, Texas. I went there, and it was one of the things that moved me from being a consultant and to getting into university and doing research. I wanted to spend my time doing research. I was intrigued by the research papers that were presented. Four years later, I went back to College Station for the second international conference on expansive soils. And uh, that time I presented my first conference paper. And uh, then I was hired at the University of Saskatchewan to set up a research uh, program. And then over the years, there was a subcommittee formed by the ASC on expansive soils. And uh, I convinced them, them and uh, others to uh, change the name from expansive soils to unsaturated soils because the scope would be much broader. And it turned out, uh, and then uh, the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Foundation Engineering asked me to chair their uh, subcommittee on unsaturated soils. And I did that for 12 years. But uh, how I became in, involved with the Geo Institute was in planning of conferences, um, Pan American conferences, Mm -hmm. the um, international conference uh, uh, with soil mechanics er, and uh, unsaturated soils. Um, I worked with Sandra Houston out of uh, Arizona State University and um, became part of the American group and it was good because we needed to have a critical mass of people in order to develop unsaturated soil mechanics um, had more people involved that is great well we thank you both for all the time and effort you've spent uh, on ASCE and GI over the years we're really nothing without our volunteers and we I think are reminded of that daily so thanks for all the time and effort you've put in I want to ask a question about where you both live now. A lot of Americans probably don't even know where Saskatchewan is. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I will note that I had to learn in Canadian history in fifth grade. Uh, we had our little Big Al saw my old queen naked to keep the provinces straight west to east. <laughs> um, that was our mnemonic that we used. Um <laughs> How has living and working in Saskatchewan impacted your careers? Do you, do you both feel that you would have done anything differently if you had spent most of your time in Toronto or New York, for example? We'll start with you, Dell, on that one. Well, I was born on a little farm 200 miles east of Saskatoon. It was my grandfather homesteaded, came from Sweden. And, and in, on this little farm was a stream, a small stream that ran through. And as a kid... Even before I went to school, I would go down with my little shovel and build dams across this stream. So I was very much, uh, I thought I would be a farmer all my life. And I, uh, but as I went to university, I realized, hold it, we're living in a very unique climatic condition of of the world. It's a semi-arid region. There is more moisture that goes up to the sky every year then comes down in rainfall. Therefore, the soils are drying out, drying out, and drying out. And when they build houses, we have serious problems. The most serious geotechnical problem on the prairies is expansive soils. And so um, I, the climate in which I was raised and born here greatly influenced what happened. I was started into research in that, and then I expanded it to unsaturated soils. But I think, um, you know, the winters are very severe in Saskatchewan, and it's hard to get professors to come and teach at our university because they'd rather go and teach at the University of British Columbia or someplace like that. But I was raised in Saskatchewan, and it very much affected uh, where I would spend my life and where I I would enjoy 
living and uh, raising a family. That is great. What about you, Murray? How has how has SK impacted you? Well, it's always. Uh, I think it's interesting that my my wife always looks at it and says, "You you develop slope stability software in Saskatchewan, like <laughs> the flattest part of the world, and you develop slope stability." So she brings it down to earth for me, which always is kind of a funny comparison. But really, the science of anything can be projected around the world. And it really doesn't matter where you are as much anymore in the modern world. So it's uh, it's it works out. I mean, I, I grew up, uh, I enjoyed growing up in Saskatoon. I always wanted to see the bigger world. I, I thought I, I never want to live in Saskatchewan or Saskatoon when I grew up. And then, um, you know, I lived a few different other places, met my wife down in Texas. Here she's from Saskatoon. We moved back here. And it's just a great place to move uh, to to raise a family, and and they got a great university here that I went to for many years, and so it just kind of flowed into um, you know living here and starting the company here and taking uh, employees from the university, which is a great source of brain power, and uh, so it's it's been a good place to grow the company and to raise a family, and uh, that I think. The reason we get so much done is because the winters are so cold. There's nothing else to do except program computers. And so you <laughs> might as well. We lost you there for a second. That's the first technical glitch we've had in director's oh, cut okay. history. It's very exciting. Which part do you, did you lose? Or where? what did I last I think say? just the end of the sentence. I think we're okay because everybody got the message, but you were glitched there for a second. Oh, okay. So we, we have three questions left, and one is going to be very serious and have a lot of gravity and make you think, and the other two are hopefully pretty fun. And either one of you can start with this one because it's really a joint question. What what trip or vacation that you two took together in your lives is the most memorable? I'll start with that because <laughs> I'll, I'll take uh, I'll confess uh, my my problem. It, the trip was to Alexandria, Egypt, for the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Foundation Engineering. I took the trip with Murray. One of the first times that we traveled to a conference together. And so I sort of looked at the my flight schedule when we came to leave Alexandria. And I, I was responsible for getting us to the airport and so on. I was looking at the wrong sheet. <laughs> and I arrived at the airport only to find that the... We arrived at the airport. Find that the terminal was closed. There was... It was, we were left with our suitcases out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I had been looking at the wrong <laughs> sheet and I got the wrong, I, we missed the plane by three or four hours. It was not easy to get out of Alexandria, Egypt. And I, it cost us a lot of money by the time we got back into Saskatoon. So that was very memorable. I have other memorable trips too. I took Murray and my daughter as well to Vietnam on one of the trips to see what the country was like. I took Murray with to Kenya in Africa and, uh, and th that was another developing country and he got to see. A lot of my research has been related to dry soils and dry soils are found in developing countries yeah. And they are poor countries. So assessing the lifestyle of developing countries was very important uh, to us. I, I have to ask you a philosophical question about this. Is it worse to miss a plane by three hours or three minutes? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. My my wife has a story about her family missing the a plane and seeing it take off outside the window where they were in at the airport. And I'm not sure if it would have been more painful to just yeah. miss it completely and be several hours late. But it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Murray, what about you? What's your most memorable trip with your with your dad? Well, it's funny because we didn't talk about this, but I, I immediately thought of Egypt there, that trip. <laughs> because when we got there and we missed the plane, I thought, oh, well, there's got to be another flight out today. And then I realized, well, no, the whole airport shut down. Like that was the one flight of the day. 
<laughs> went out of Alexandria, <laughs> Egypt. And so we had to find, and then the, the cabbie wasn't, I mean, he was, uh, of course, heartbroken that we missed our flight and then charged us triple to go to another hotel <laughs> because we are existing, uh, Hotel had run out the booking, so then we had to try to find another hotel uh, to stay at for for one more night till we could get out of Alexandria. So, anyway, it wasn't a big deal. We got to see a little bit more of the world and take a more circuitous route home, <laughs> and uh, work in a few airports, and it, it ended up being a good bonding experience, I think. And, and probably uh, one of those experiences <laughs> that wasn't very funny at the time, but when you look back on it, is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really was, and we managed to get home, but. Uh, yeah, we, uh, the the trips that stick out in my mind that I took with that are uh, those other two we mentioned. We had a great trip to Vietnam with some other grad, graduate students at the time. Uh, there was, I think, all set of maybe about 10 of us and my sister. And um, it, it was a fantastic trip just to see Vietnam and see the country and experience the people and the culture. Uh, and just a really quite a memorable trip. Uh, I do remember Kenya as well. And just the people were great, and we got to see and travel around and and see a good part of the country. It was just very interesting for me. That was just after I graduated uh, undergrad engineering, and so just fantastic trips that I'm I'm very grateful I, I had. And uh, I mean, over the years, other trips, more minor ones that I mean, Dad spent some time with working with Sandra Houston in Arizona, and then we would had we had a young family at the time. They loved going down to visit Grandma and Grandpa in Arizona. And my kids have great memories of that. And they just love that, seeing that. So those are some some good family memories as well. Well, it's great that you guys have so many of these stories together, which means you've done a lot of traveling together. And uh, th- those, are, those are great experiences. <laughs> yeah, the one in Kenya, I'll just mention one other thing here. We were traveling around on the bus. And all of a sudden, I mean, it's a deserted road. There's maybe 10 of us in this bus. We're going along and there's there's this wall of kind of high, I don't know, it was bamboo or something along the side of the road. All of a sudden, a guy comes out in in khaki fatigues and hold up, holds up his hand. I notice because I'm sitting in the front of the bus, he has an AK-47. And all of these stories about being kidnapped and in a foreign country and whatever come to mind. And, and he walks up and starts talking to the driver. And I'm watching to see if this is, you know, it's it's Swahili. And I don't know if this is going south or not. But the, the engagement seems to be somewhat amicable. And then the guy gets on the truck and we keep driving. And uh, he just stays with us and, and we talk back. And I find out that they've had troubles with buses being ambushed in this stretch of road. Mm-hmm. So they've sent a, a guard to just stay on the buses with the tourists as they go on this stretch of the road. And then he gets off at the next stop. And he stayed on us for maybe three or four hours and rode with us. And so it was all good. But... Uh, Initially, it didn't sound like it might not be so good. So. <laughs> not everything is as it initially appears. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here's, we ask a lot of nostalgia questions on Director's Cut. Here's one where you have to rub your crystal ball, shine it up, and look into the future. And I th- we'll start with Murray, I guess, on this one. Looking ahead 25 years. I picked that number arbitrarily, by the way. What change <laughs> do you think will be the most si- significant for civil or geotechnical engineering? Well, immediately coming to mind, when you say 25 years, that is like infinite space in software world. So, right. I mean, if we can predict things out five years, we're really happy. And uh, But what I think comes to mind is, I, I mean, and Bentley is well suited on this, is really the computer is going to become a bigger, more present tool in our analysis. Uh, Bentley has this concept of digital twinning things. So, in other words, the ability to replicate sites digitally on the computer then model them in space and time and have feedback from instrumentation, I think is going to do us well in the future. And that's going to be something that leads us down a path where we can analyze and use leverage the computer and the simulation ability in a much bigger way going into the future. And so, and just our ability to represent the real world physics replicate the whole site on the computer and that kind of thing is going to be heightened. That's great. Dell, what about you? 2046. Yeah. Between now and then. 
<laughs> yeah, actually, uh, Brad, this is one of the easier questions because I think I could say anything and uh, I won't be around to see whether it's going to happen or not. But I am reminded of Bill Gates was asked a question when the, the desktop computer first came out. And he, in his interview, said, uh, predicting the future of the laptop computer, said, I think that 64 KB will be all the memory that will ever be required on a laptop computer. He was completely wrong, but he made a lot of money. So in that sense, <laughs> he, was, he was all right. So, But we have gone through a paradigm shift. We haven't just gone through a slow development. It's a completely different way of looking at problems. We have new kinds of solutions that we never thought of before. So in our mind, we, we extrapolate forward linearly, just saying things are going to improve. We're going to do a little better, a little better, a little better. Paradigm shifts can't be predicted, but they are the most significant. And we have truly gone through a paradigm shift, and it's one that's been very good for unsaturated soil mechanics because the field I'm in is called nonlinear soil mechanics. You have to iterate over and over and over again to get solutions. No matter what your problem is, you're iterating all the. We could never do this. We'd never live long enough to solve our unsaturated soils problem if it wasn't for the digital computer. And so the, the digital computer is going to play a big ro role. I almost have to say the same thing Murray said. How big a role it's going to play, we really don't know. But I think it's going to be bigger than what what we can imagine. And I think artificial intelligence is going to have, yeah. going to develop beyond what we can imagine. Well, that is great. You both kind of ended up in the same place there, which everyone should take note. Uh, <laughs> very wise <laughs> statements there. Final question is another fun one. It's another Saskatchewan question. What is Saskatchewan's greatest cultural gift to the world, in your opinion? And the, the two that I came up with immediately were Gordie Howe, of course, the Detroit Red Wings legend. Uh, I grew up in Michigan. He was a big deal there. Corner Gas, one of my favorite TV shows of all time. If you have not <laughs> watched it, viewers, you should go hunt it down. Or is it something else? And Dell, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, well... I have to agree with you that apart from Gordie Howe, it, it's hard to find a, 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 a cultural identity that is affected or put Saskatoon on the map. Um, a lot of people from south of the 49th parallel have real trouble pronouncing Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. They wonder if we're talking a foreign language. <laughs> but we are a province with um, ethnic diversity. Nowhere, no matter where you go, you, you find there's a village and it's got two or three um, different ethnic backgrounds. I grew up in a community that had 25% about Swedish, 25% Norwegian, 25% Polish, 25% Ukrainian. And uh, so we're very much a melting pot of many different uh, backgrounds of people. And uh, I have never thought of... Um, Racism as being a problem. And so I, I think one of the things that I like to look back on and say, I'm very thankful for where I was uh, allowed to grow up and, uh, and uh, go to university and go to school. I, um, I can't think of any specific person. Uh, Gordy Howe comes to mind because when I was 17 years old and living in my little village of 500 people, believe it or not, Gordy Howe came to our village in the summertime and he played baseball with a, a team from Saskatoon. That's 200 miles away. Gordy Howe played first base. I still remember that. And we went up after and he signed, autographed my glove. So, yes, apart from Gordy Howe, it's hard to find anybody else. How long did you hang on to that baseball glove for? I still, I still have the baseball glove, but uh, the autograph is worn off. 
<laughs> but but I I have the baseball glove hanging in my garage, and my grandchildren look at it, and Dad, they say, Dad, how could you ever catch a ball with that thing? <laughs> it's like a flat plant pancake. <laughs> that's that's how they are. I've got my grandfather's catcher's mitt from the late 1930s, and it looks like a donut with the hole filled in. It's yeah. So I've tried to explain to my kids the two-handed catching thing and doesn't really <laughs> translate well to the 21st century. So, Murray, what about you? The, the greatest <laughs> cultural impact Saskatchewan has had, in your opinion. Greatest cultural impact. Well, I, I mean, I have to go with Corner Gas overall because my wife bought me several seasons of the show and we love it. And it's really funny. So um, we've we've enjoyed that over the years. But, uh, I mean... Two things come to mind. My our greatest, one of our greatest exports is hockey players. I think. I think there's they're all over the place and on different teams. And uh, my wife and I enjoy watching that. And it's it's always fun to see a, a homegrown boy making it big some other place in the world. And that's great. And they they a lot of them come back. You have to be careful when you when you play pickup hockey in Saskatchewan because <laughs> a lot of them come back for the summer and they just play as a part of these pickup games and so you're just going out there paying 10 bucks and playing pickup hockey and there's some guy that's you know the enforcer for florida and he's on the ice and you don't realize it and if you get into a fight with him you know how that's going <laughs> so i got to be a little careful in some of the pickup games but um you know i think i mean what i would say has been interesting for me to watch is that i mean i grew up here i didn't have a, maybe an appreciation for the what saskatchewan brings to uh, the world, but I, as I've seen and been a part of business, I've seen graduates come from Saskatchewan, be educated here, and then be picked off by major companies um, down, you know, being snagged up by Pixar and, and and working for large Microsoft and and EA Sports, large gaming firms around the world. And when I've when I've sat down with some of these guys and said, well, why do they why do they target Saskatchewan? And why are they like? Why is Saskatchewan even on the map when they're recruiting for employees? And they say, well, it's it's just you know people come from small towns, they come into the cities, they get educated, they have a good work ethic, and they're great employees. And they're you know they they work hard, keep their head down, and they end up being good employees. And that always impacted me that you know you uh, what Saskatchewan brings to the world in terms of getting things done, being a, a valued part of the process in, in growth of major companies, it's always in, interesting for me to see how Saskatchewan's placed. That is fantastic. You two have survived. You made it through all 10 director's cut questions, gave some great answers, amazing storytelling, and we are super appreciative of that. For our viewers, if you enjoyed what you saw today, and I think you did if you're still watching here at the end, there are 23 other episodes of Director's Cut already. Check out the playlists on the YouTube channel that you're currently watching this on. If you liked it even more than that, click the subscribe button, click get notifications. We will let you know every single time we post a new video to the channel, which is frequently. So Dell and Murray, thank you again so much for doing this today. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Brad, for having me. Yeah, appreciate it, Brad. Thanks. And we will see everybody next week.